Um, so for the most part, as we've been learning about transverse myelitis, we haven't known any genetic susceptibility. And so it really came as a surprise when Sandy called me and he said, I have two sisters, both of them have uh, transverse myelitis, do you want to talk to them? And my first thought was, there's no genetics involved in transverse myelitis, you know, what are the chances? But um, we did anyway, and my first inclination was, I bet one of them doesn't have true monophasic transverse myelitis, it's gonna be MS or something like that, but no, they both had transverse myelitis. And so we undertook this study, um, and again, I just wanna emphasize which type of transverse myelitis we're talking about here. We're talking about the acute type, the one that comes on suddenly, that doesn't have an explanation like neuromyelitis optica, it just happens one time and one time only, and it causes a lesion in the spinal cord with disability um, from that attack. And as you know, this is the very rare type. Most types of transverse myelitis uh, occur with multiple sclerosis, but this type that happens once and only once is about one to two per million. So that's how rare we're talking here. And as Dr. Greenberg said, there, the thought, there was thought to be a female predominance, but maybe in kids it's more equal. Um, and we didn't notice a seasonality to it at the time. But like I said, the genetics underlying any sort of susceptibility in transverse myelitis was completely unknown. We didn't really have enough patient families to make any sort of conclusion about genetics until Sandy called. And this is the story of the first patient who had her onset at age 15, but this was a while ago. This was, uh, she's in her 50s now, so this happened many, many years prior. She woke up with um, weakness, sensory loss, bladder dysfunction. It was in the days before MRI. And she had a spinal tap, but we couldn't get the results because that hospital had long since been closed. They probably threw away the records. But what we, the reason we think that this was transverse myelitis, and they recognized it as such, is because she got a course of steroids and she seemed to improve. It took her a while to get out of a wheelchair, but now she uses an assist device and can walk. Here's her MRI that was done, I don't know, maybe 30 years after the fact. And the lesion is still there. You can hardly make out this little white uh, vertical line here within the gray spinal cord. So it's pretty small. I point to it with this arrow here. If you take a cross section of the spinal cord and look down, the, the spinal cord is here in gray. And the lesions are those two white dots. That's all that's left. That's the scar at 30 years after, after an attack. That was the first case. Then the reason this was brought to our attention is because her sister had a very similar presentation, except it was 35 years later at age 50. Her onset was also acute. She had some weakness, although not as um, severe, some sensory, some bowel, uh, bladder issues. And her MRI, um, is a little bit more subtle. I'm not sure if you can make it out. Um, but her lesion was right here, pointed to by the arrow. And again, pointed to on the cross section here by the arrow, was a little bit smaller and she got treated uh, pretty quickly and then responded pretty well to steroids. And both of these sisters did not have a relapsing disease because they've gone at least five years, or in the case of the first sister, 35 years, um, with no, no additional attacks. So we know that this was the monophasic idiopathic transverse myelitis variety. And we took these numbers, we, you know, one, one to two per million in one family having two sisters. We took that to our geneticists at Johns Hopkins and we said, what are the chances, right? So they agreed with us and they said, hey, let's look for a genetic basis. Here are some of the technical details for what, what the folks at Johns Hopkins did in collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine. What this involves is sequencing every base pair in the genome. There are 3.1 billion base pairs, A, T, Gs, and Cs, that comprise your, your genome. And they sequenced every single one of them in the two sisters and their three healthy siblings. They have three, uh, one sister and two brothers, I believe, and none of them, none of the three siblings had transverse myelitis as yet. So we sequenced as many as we could, and then we looked for differences. What did the two sisters have that the other three siblings did not have? And what I'm showing you here is called a chromatogram. 
This is a, a zoom in, a snapshot of one gene, and you can see here, here are all the A, T, Gs, and Cs. They're represented by these peaks here. The higher the peak, the more reliable the call. And they're color-coded. So I can't tell what color this is, but a green is an A. Uh, and what it's supposed to be is a C. And literally, out of 3.1 billion letters, there's only one difference here. Um, the two sisters had an A. All of her, all of the other siblings had a C. There was one brother who had a mix. You could see there are two peaks there. Uh, the, the computer called an A, but you could see there's two peaks, and that's because he was a carrier. So he had one gene from the mom and one gene from the dad, and one of them was an A and one of them was a C. But the two sisters got the two A's, and the rest of the world has two C's. Um, now what's really interesting is when you look throughout all of the populations in the world that have been sequenced, and there are at least a quarter of a million now, and all of their DNA is in these searchable databases. And you could look through and see, well, what are the chances that this, that this could be present in the world somewhere else in people who don't have transverse myelitis? And the answer is zero. It's not another single human being that's ever been sequenced who has two A's right there, like our two sisters have. Not a single human being. Then you look in other animals, and you say, okay, in this same gene, what are the chances that the result of that a would be mutated, and there's not a single animal in the animal kingdom that has this mutation. So we thought, wow, this is really, really, really rare, and it might be clinically meaningful to not have this mutation here because no other animal has that. But then we thought, okay, maybe this explains just these two sisters, right? What are the chances that other people with transverse myelitis would have this mutation when no one else in the world has ever had it? So that's the question we asked of our uh, patients who came to our patient day, um, transverse myelitis patient day at Johns Hopkins. Um, this, and we happened, to, um, we happened to get 86 samples total with transverse myelitis, 25 with neuromyelitis optica, 25 with multiple sclerosis. These are control groups who also get transverse myelitis as part of their disease, but it's not the type we're talking about, which is the monophasic type. We also had a few healthy controls, which was really unnecessary because we already have a quarter of a million in databases, but, but still. And we did find another woman who came to our patient day who had this story. Age 51, woke up with sensory loss, weakness, and pain around her, her chest. Her MRI was done, and it showed a lesion pretty similar to our two sisters here. You could see the whiteness within the gray. Um, you could see most of her spinal cord at this level was white, that's the lesion. So a little bit more obvious of an MRI. And she too had the exact same extremely rare genetic mutation that the two sisters had. And the sister, this patient happened to come with her sister from Canada, and we also sequenced that sister, and she's a carrier for that mutation, just like one of the brothers was. So now we have two separate families. We have one family, I didn't mention the two sisters are Polish origin. This patient here was uh, Scotch-Irish. So two separate family trees. Uh, all three patients have this monophasic transverse myelitis. In one case, it's familial, where there's two patients. In the other case, no, no family history, but she also tested positive. Here's the pedigree. You can see the first family. I wish we had the parents to sequence to see if they were carriers. But here are the two sisters who were both affected. Uh, oh, I'm missing one of the family members. I apologize. Um, here's the, one of the brothers who's a carrier. There's an, another brother here who's healthy and a, not a carrier. And another sister here I'm not showing who's also not a carrier. And then this other family here with one sister who has transverse myelitis and her healthy carrier sister. It suggests that this is passed down from, from the parents. The fact that you have multiple siblings who have the disease with both, um, who have a, what's called a recessive presentation, that is both genes are mutated, and healthy family members with only one gene that's mutated suggests that it's coming from the parents. So what's this gene that, that's involved in, in transverse myelitis? It's a gene called vacuolar protein sorting 37A. And I first saw this, I was like, what in the, what, VPS 37A, what is that? Had to look it up. 
it's not really known to neurologists. This is not a gene associated with any um, immunological process at all. And what it does is, this is a cell here in green, and all these purple dots here are proteins on the surface of the, of the cell. And VPS37A just helps bring those proteins into the cell and recycles them, decides if the protein should go back out onto the surface of the cell or get chewed up in, and broken down into its components. That's what VPS37A does. And nobody's really thought of this process being involved in transverse myelitis. VPS37A, turns out, is only one of over 30 proteins that's involved in this protein recycling process. So there are a lot of other proteins here that are involved in neurological diseases. There's one, can't really see the slide so well, but there's one within this escort one system that's involved in Alzheimer's disease. There's one that's involved in hereditary spastic paraplegia, which is another spinal cord disease. But none of those are immunological. This is the first one, this transverse myelitis mutation is the first one that we found that's associated with an an immunological process. Here's what it looks like in cells. Um, this happens to be brain tumor cells. And you can see in green here, this is that VPS37A protein just doing its job. It's not mutated here, it's just within a cancer cell recycling proteins. This is what it normally does. It's also present in the gut. It's present in almost every cell in your body, including the spinal cord, but why, why would it be doing something in the spinal cord to disrupt um, function there and not anywhere else in the body? We don't know the answer to that. But as I mentioned, there's lots of other diseases now that are being associated with protein recycling genes, and it gives us a little idea about how this might be involved. Um, to give you a sense of what we're thinking, here I have listed three infections that involve the nervous system. One is called herpes simplex encephalitis, West Nile virus, and another really rare necrotizing encephalopathy. And these infections occur more commonly in people and kids who have these genetic mutations. These are all different genes and they all have mutations in them. And so these people are more susceptible to an infection in the nervous system than people who don't have the mutations. And the same might be true for people who have this mutation in VPS37A. Perhaps it takes this mutation plus the context of an infection, and then together they may contribute to the phenotype of transverse myelitis. So this is why I've been begging for your DNA across the hall. I want to see if uh, we could put together a mechanism for how VPS37A is involved in transverse myelitis. And it's not just transverse myelitis that I'm interested in. The truth is, if, if this protein recycling mechanism can be disrupted and cause transverse myelitis, perhaps it's involved in other neuroimmunological diseases or maybe other diseases that are um, not, ju not just confined to the nervous system, lupus and myasthenia gravis, other diseases where protein recycling interact with the immune system even outside of the neurologic system. Same three kids. <laughs> Happy to take questions at the end. Thank you so much.